Welcome to ECLMU Learning Simplified and welcome to this lesson. In the previous lessons, we discussed the principle of transmission of pressure in liquids or what we call Pascal's principle. And we said it states that pressure applied at one point of an enclosed system is transmitted equally within the liquid. And we also looked at examples or the applications of that principle and we said one of it was hydraulic brake system then the other one was hydraulic press and then the other one was hydraulic lift now in this lesson we are going to discuss the hydraulic brake system my name is albert i hope you will enjoy the lesson by the end of this lesson i expect you to be able to explain the working of an hydraulic brake system and then finally give the properties of a good hydraulic brake fluid i hope you have ever seen this uh, leak fluid which we call brake fluid now we are going to see what the property must be possessed by a fluid for it to be used uh, as an hydraulic fluid hydraulic brake system is a system of braking which we use in most vehicles and this system applies the principle of transmission of pressure in liquids that is pascal's principle and by the way if i can ask you have you ever seen a driver applying brakes to stop a fast moving car and how much or how much force does he use does he use a lot of force literally you will tell me he uses a very small amount of force but now how does it manage to stop that uh, fast moving car or rolly? That's what you are going to discuss here. So the first thing that you should note as a student is that you must know the major parts of hydraulic brake system. The first part is the brake pedal. That's where the driver steps on. We have a master cylinder here. This is where pressure will be generated by the force which will be caused from the brake pedal. We are going to see later. Then we have the brake fluid. This is the third major part. The brake fluid, the one which would transmit this pressure. Then we have to the other wheels, that is like this wheel, some other four wheels. Then we have what we call the slave cylinder. Slave cylinder is the one which will receive pressure from the master cylinder. Then we have what we call the brake shoe. Brake shoe is the one adjacent to the uh, master, to the slave cylinder. Then we have brake lining. Then we have the drum. The drum is the outer part. Then of course we have at the brake shoe, we have a pivot and then we have a turning spring which returns the drum, the brake lining and the brake shoe into position when the force or when the pressure has been withdrawn. Now this is how an hydraulic brake system work. It starts when a driver applies a very small amount of force here at the brake pedal, now the force will be magnified at this point. This force will be magnified to be a very large force at this point. We are going to discuss in a topic called moments in form two. We are going to realize that the force times distance on the upper part must be equal to the force generated here now times this distance. This, since this distance is small, it needs a large force so that it can balance. So at this point, that's where the force is magnified. Now the magnified force which will come to this master cylinder will meet this master piston. You have something called a master piston. The master piston has a very small area. Small area, remember, it means it will generate a lot of pressure. Since the force which is coming is large, it meets a small surface area of the piston at the master cylinder. It will generate pressure on this brake fluid now the brake fluid using pascal's principle will transmit the pressure generated at the master's piston to all parts or to all wheels the four wheels of the vehicle now when this pressure comes or when this pressure is transmitted in this let's look at a case where it enters in one wheel when it comes into one wheel here it will meet what we call the slave cylinder it will meet the slave cylinder a slave cylinder is also small but now it has two pistons a slave cylinder has two pistons we have piston one 
and we have piston two. These two pistons are in contact with what we call a brake shoe. So when this pressure now presses the brake shoe, the brake shoe will enlarge or will move out through this piston. It has a piston down here, so it can, it's flexible, it can move sideways. Now when the pressure from the master cylinder comes into slave cylinder, it meets these two pistons which are in contact with the brake shoe, it will press out the brake shoe through this pivot. Now, when the brake shoe is placed out, it also presses the brake lining. Brake lining is the black part that you can see here. On both sides, we have a brake lining. So each part of the brake shoe will place the brake lining on each side. And now that brake lining will replace the drum. And when the drum is placed, that is when the car stops. Now, when the car stops, if you want to release the brake, when the, the when the the driver withdraws the force at the brake pedal, it means now there will be no pressure which will be generated in the in the fluid. So the the, the master cylinder will relax. When the master master cylinder relaxes, it means this piston will move back. When the piston moves back, then also this fluid which was compressed at this point or which was as was moving at this point it will go back to relax then through this return spring the brake shoe will also relax it will stop touching the brake lining and when the brake lining is as relaxed also the drum will not be touched so in that case you have withdrawn your brakes so this returning spring it helps to relax the brake shoe which also relaxes the brake lining, which stops touching the drum. So that is how an hydraulic brake system works. First, it starts from the force at the brake pedal. The force at the brake pedal is magnified, is magnified at this juncture here. We are going to discuss it in form two. It comes to the master cylinder as a very great force. That great force now is the one now which will generate pressure. The the, the driver does not generate pressure on the brake. He only generates a force or gives a force. The force will be magnified and when it enters into the master cylinder, it will get a, a slave cylinder with some area. Since force is coming, now force divided by the area of the master uh, cylinder will generate pressure at the master cylinder. The pressure which will be generated in the fluid in the master cylinder will be the one which will be transmitted the other ways. Now, when it arrives at the other wheels, it will meet what we call the slave cylinder. The slave cylinder has two pistons, one on the left and the one on the right side. Those two pistons are in contact with the brake shoe. Now, they, now the brake shoe has a pivot, so it means it can relax or it can it is flexible, it can move easily. The, the, the sh brake shoe will press out the, or the, 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 the slave, the Slave cylinder will press the brake shoe and the brake shoe now will press the brake lining and then the brake lining will place the drum. Very important. Now when the, the, the driver withdraws the force, the return or the returning spring will compress back the brake shoe, then the brake lining will relax, the drum will not be touched. So it's very important to know how to explain this and how to draw and label a well-labeled diagram of an hydraulic brake system. Now the hydraulic fluid that we use in hydraulic machines must have specific properties and the first property is that it should have low freezing point and high boiling point. We have reasons why it should have low freezing point. Low freezing point and then should have high boiling point. Now, the reason why it should have low freezing point is to avoid to avoid it from changing to solid. If the freezing point is high, it means it can change to a solid easily. And if it changes to a solid, it means now the brake will not work or the machine will not work because the machine only requires a liquids. Then high boiling point is to avoid to avoid it from changing to gas. We are going to see gases are not good uh, to be used as hydraulic fluids. 
The reason is because gases, when they are compressed or when pressure is applied to gases, they decrease their volume and we don't want uh, liquid uh, substances which behaves like that. So another property is that it should not corrode the parts of the system. If it corrodes the part of the system, it means there will be a leakage in the system and then it means now pressure will not be transmitted equally. And then the other thing is that it should be highly incompressible. Be very keen on this word, incompressible. Some student mis mis misinterpret it with compressible. Now, I'm going to give you uh, differences of compressible and incompressible so that you get the difference. We have incompressible, incompressible, incompressible. This is what we want. Incompressible is what we want. Then we have compressible, compressible, compressible. This is what we don't want in the brake system. So compressible, it means if you have a substance like this, like now the fluid that we are going to use, the particles are arranged in this uh, uh, fluid in such a way that the intermolecular distance or the space between them is very small. And if you apply pressure at this point, the system, all this uh, fluid will move without changing volume. This break or this fluid will move without changing volume, without changing volume, without changing volume. So in this case, it has not been compressed. Compressed means it has now reduced volume. So in this case, if it's incompressible, it means as pressure is applied, the fluid will not change volume. It will move the way it is to all parts. But now, if you have compressible, it means like in gases, we're going to discuss in the next topic, which is particular nature of matter. If you have gases like this, the particles are very far away from each other. And now, if you apply some pressure at this point, the first thing that will be done on this, these uh, gases will change volume. They will compress it that the particles can come close. So this is what will happen. They will compress and then particles will come close like that. So in this case, it has changed the volume from its original volume to a very small volume. So in this case, it means it could leave some gaps in between the, the gases particles and then pressure cannot be transmitted. And in fact, it will waste some of the force because it will waste some force which will be used to, co to change the volume first before it goes. But in the first case, the, the, there's no force or energy which will be wasted in changing the volume. Once you apply pressure at one point, it gets transmitted. But for gases, that is not the case. So in that case, we say it's compressible. So we don't want gases. We don't use gases. We don't use gases because they are compressible. We use, we use liquids. We use liquids because they are incompressible. Now, another thing, the last property is that the liquid must maintain uniform viscosity and a wide range of temperature. Viscosity, remember, we said is the resistance or friction in fluids. So the liquid that we, must, we, we will use must have uniform viscosity. Say so that if there is an increase in temperature, there is no increase in resistance of motion of this fluid. And if there is low temperature, there's no increase or decrease in resistance of this uh, fluid. So it must have uniform physicality. The resistance between the fluid should be uniform for you to use that uh, liquid or fluid as an hydraulic fluid in hydraulic machines. So that is the end of our lesson today. In the next lesson, we will discuss atmospheric pressure.